My name is Poonam Lamba. I'm a product manager for GKE. I focus on policy and compliance for GKE. And I'm Jim Baguadia, co-founder, CEO at Nirmata, also a policy work group co-chair with Poonam and a maintainer in the Kiverno project. So today we are going to cover cloud native security. We're gonna compare traditional security with cloud native security. Uh, we're going to talk about shift left. Why do you need shift left? Then we're going to go into shift down security. And we'll take three examples, vulnerabilities, misconfiguration, and supply chain security. And we'll talk about how do you shift down on these three security uh, features. We talk about some next steps. We'll share some reading material with you. Um, and, and of course, we have um, some takeaways that will talk about a little bit more. So let's jump right in. How many of you have seen a picture similar to this? Some of you have. This is a top of the line traditional system which processes half of US economy. It's a big financial um, institute for which I happen to work and the security was implemented um, like this. The data centers were segmented, and uh, this was hundreds of microservices or uh, typical Java-based applications uh, where a request landed on DMZ, then it goes to a secure data center, which is, again, geographically, geographically distributed. And then from there, you can go to another secure data center where you can actually talk to other systems. Traditional security is, is parameter-based. We trust everything which is inside of the parameter, or at least you know, that's how we approach it. The environments which are built for applications, they are static. Uh, you build them once, and then the changes are minimal. And the environments are typically suited for applications or specific needs that a particular software has. Oftentimes, the deployment practices and processes, it could be manual, could be automated, but the options and toolings that we have in the traditional world are limited. And last but not the least, the applications may be monolithic applications. Um, so you have a fixed set of security standards and practices for which you have designed those systems. On the contrary, cloud native security does not assume any implicit trust. It is dynamic. It is suited for um, environments which go up and down, which change very frequently. For deploying your applications, you have a range of products that you can choose from. And oftentimes, your deployment is, is automated. You're doing some sort of CI, CD. Um, and oftentimes, the services that you have in mind when you're designing a cloud-native security system is, is services, loosely coupled services for building distributed systems. Shifting left on security. So I was talking about that large system, the picture that I showed in the very beginning. I happened to work on this, so this is a real example. We were a small team of five developers, and we were building all these very nice services, you know, 10 services. It worked really well. We didn't have any issues. But then we started growing our team. We added new people. And we went from, you know, five developers to, you know, 80, 100 developers. And services grew from uh, 10 services to, to a lot of services. And then we started seeing repetitive issues that happened in production because people configured something wrong and we spent a lot of time on code reviews. But even then, things were just uh, slipping in production and we decided to do something about it. So what we ended up doing is creating a Jenkins plugin because at that time we were just using Jenkins as our CI uh, tool. And we made sure that the, the plugin, you can add it to your IDE. And uh, you know that is how we sort of approach that problem. 
which by the way also added a bunch of over overhead because we built it, then we had to maintain it, we had to update it, and a lot of developers didn't really listen, so they didn't add it to their ID anyway. So it created quite a bit of noise um, when things went into uh, one environment to the other environment. Shift left just means that you're trying to find the problems uh, in your code, in your security side ahead of time. So solving those problems is not as expensive because if you find a defect in production, it could lead to you know, business or reputation loss. If you find it in a, a development environment, ideally that is where you want to find all of these issues and bugs. So you can shift as, as left as you're typing things and you know, your ID is suggesting the best practices for your security, for your configuration and things as such. There are also, you know, this is, this is real. How many of you relate to this? <laughs> All right, some of you do. I relate to this as well. I feel like we expect too much from our developers. They have to be full stack. They have to know front end, they have to know back end, they have to understand configurations, uh, they have to scale the systems, availability, reliability, load balancing, networking. We expect them to understand you know, layer seven security, all of that. You can, you can hear my frustration a little bit. On top of that, you know, we have vulnerabilities, thousands of them just show up and you don't have much context, you don't understand everything, you have to learn new applications, new container platforms, and, and all that. So there is a problem with shifting everything left to the developers and expect them to, to know everything and be happy uh, about it. There are many challenges in shift left approach. Now we are not saying that it is not helpful or useful. I picked up two that I specifically want to highlight. The first one is false positives. Um, you know, you get too many notifications and you, know, you turn things off because you are fatigued by the alerts that you're receiving. Whether it is vulnerabilities or whether it is you, know, you have to make changes to certain uh, formatting of your code, it's very, very problematic. And the second thing is, think about a large organization where you want to do things consistently. And if everybody has their own CI pipeline and, and they have shifted left, but you have thousands of, of applications and you do not have a way to ensure that all of those pipelines are working in a consistent way. So you need something else. Now Jim is going to talk about what shifting down means. Thank you, Poonam. Yeah, so before we try and define what shift down can mean and what you know, we can do about it, it's good to revisit roles in a large enterprise, right? So typically, you have your platform teams or your ops teams who are you know, chartered with um, unburdening your application teams from tasks like whether it's with provisioning or whether it's deploying applications, creating best practices. You have the app teams, of course, and their charter is to deliver business value. The more code they can deploy, the faster they can innovate, the, and you know, the more features you can get to customers, you're increasing your business value. And security teams, unfortunately, although they sometimes get portrayed as the gatekeepers or people who are you know, perhaps hindering some of, of that productivity or innovation, their job is also very critical in terms of making sure that features which do go to customers are secure, the systems are you know, not something that can be uh, penetrated either at runtime or through supply chain security or other problems. So all three of these teams need to work together, but ultimately the focus is to get features, get innovation um, to your customers the faster, uh, as fast as possible. So, you know, also one interesting thing is like, why, why is this important now, right? And five years ago, if we were talking about shift down security, 
it perhaps wouldn't be the right context or the right time in our industry. But today, like Poonam kind of uh, you know, walked us through, cloud native is a game changer. It has changed how we do operations. Uh, it has changed how we deploy, manage, run applications. That's the number one thing. Kubernetes, of course, being a big part of this has become the standard or the de facto standard for how we you know, operate across multiple cloud providers, infrastructure stacks, even edge computing. So now we have a common language between operations, security, development to all speak in the same terms, right? Through declarative APIs, we know how to manage configurations. We can all see the same system. And finally, this emerging you know, kind of rise of platform engineering. And again, it's an evolution of DevOps, DevSecOps in many ways. But thinking of your platform as product, enabling developer productivity, that developer experience becomes super interesting, right? So it's the convergence of all of these factors coming together at the right time in our industry. So what exactly is shift down security and how do we think about it, right? So to us, much like with your application patterns and blueprints or golden paths or whatever you might call them, you should start thinking about security in the same way. Take all of the cross-cutting concerns across applications, across your teams, and move them into a common layer. And with, like with anything cloud native, and to me, uh, codification, automation, collaboration is the mantra of cloud native, right? We want to automate everything. We want to put it as everything as code. And we want it to be collaborative across these different teams, especially application teams, developers, security teams, as well as operations or platform teams. So having that intrinsic you know, sense of you know, making sure we can use technologies like we'll talk about policy as code or VEX like you probably heard about in the keynote, that becomes important uh, as part of this. And then finally, like Poonam was also mentioning, to make shift left work, you have to shift down first, right? And that's what we also believe in. You have to have somebody who owns this. You just can't throw things over the fence and you know, say, well, developers, uh, you know, zero CVEs is the only way to go. So let's take a look at what can we do today and how can you start implementing you know, shift down in your environments with your you know, uh, teams internally. So looking at what the security team might typically do, their main charter is runtime you know, protection, threat detection, making sure that you know, runtime systems, the, uh, ultimately whatever you're delivering to customers is secure. Um, but there's also a ton of other things they have to be responsible for. The overall compliance, whether it's internal or external standards, uh, organizational compliance, as well as vulnerability management, which is a big part of it. Misconfigurations, which in many ways gets ignored because it's a tougher problem to solve across teams, right? But uh, as you, you, you know, we'll talk about, misconfigurations tend to be a very you know, leading cause of security issues. And then, of course, things emerging to things like software supply chain security, which is becoming more and more important. So as part of this, what the platform team can do, we believe, can play a role in, in a lot of these critical areas, especially when it comes to vulnerability management. We'll talk about some examples there, uh, misconfigurations, um, as well as you know, in the supply chain. And we'll go through some examples of what's happening today and would love to also hear from everybody here on what ideas we can kind of develop for the future. So the first part of it, let's talk about vulnerability management, right? We all know we have to deal with it. Uh, CVEs get published. A lot of it is noise. A lot of it might not impact your systems, but somebody has to go through and figure that out, right? So the first thing you can do is, you know, with containers, we have images. Images get baked early. Starting with the proper base images makes a significant difference in how you manage vulnerabilities. It's not going to solve everything but gets you like almost 80, 90% there to where you want to be. This is an example, and I pulled this about four, three weeks ago maybe or so, three to four, uh, of Nginx, just different images of Nginx, latest Nginx. If you go to Docker Hub, just pull this, about 130 vulnerabilities. Uh, you know, imagine having to go through those and figure out what to do and how to solve those, which ones matter, which ones don't. 
If you go to the Alpine image, immediately it drops to about 30 or so, which is more manageable. But you can go further if you go to DistroLess, which is a minimal base image, comes down to a handful. And if you look at some of the best practices companies like ChainGuard are publishing on how to build and manage images, comes down to zero. And the way they're doing this, there's no magic here. It's just by what we do with our applications, build the image often, reduce the size as much as possible, and keep patching, right? So if you're running nightly application builds, there's no reason why you shouldn't be doing nightly image builds. And if you do that, if you shrink this down, imagine the amount of noise you have reduced immediately for your developers. Now, of course, not everything will be solved in your base image. There's application code. There's things like JVMs or Python or whatever you're layering on top. So for that also, you know, there's emerging things like you heard about Vex this morning, and there's multiple sessions on it. Using standards like these and using tools like OpenVex allows developers to say, does this really matter to my application? And also allows the platform team to say, OK, if I have 50 Java apps, I know that this I can publish you know, a Vex statement and declare that, sign that, attest that, put it as part of my image, which everybody you know, who's building Java apps in the enterprise can start leveraging. Right? So simple ways, but which can go a long way in solving this complex problem. Next, Poonam is going to talk about policy as code, um, which will help with misconfigurations. Thank you, Jim. How many of you use some sort of policy product for Kubernetes? All right, all right, that's a good number. Thank you for sharing. Misconfiguration is, like Jim was saying, a leading cause of security issues. In 2023, CNCF did a survey and found that every single cluster that they surveyed had at least one misconfiguration. And 45% of the um, surveyed customers had one or more security incidents because of misconfiguration. These are just some that I captured, and, and I'm sharing uh, those with you. This is why you should care about misconfiguration. And the way you can deal with misconfiguration is by using policies. If you look at the Kubernetes definition of policy, I'm just going to read from the screen. It says configurations that manage other configurations or runtime behaviors. But my definition of policy is just a piece of code. And, and you can use that piece of code to detect misconfigurations for your platform, for your applications, and any other configuration that runs on your clusters. Some example of policy use cases for Kubernetes. There is pod security standards. You know, if you are just getting started on policy, uh, pod security standard baseline may be a good place for you to get started with. I really like those recommendations. There is, um, you can use policies for RBAC configuration, which is also one of the, the major um, security issues that has been detected, for example, if you grant you know, unauthenticated users cluster admin, that is a security issue. There could also be some industry best practices or you know, some organizational best practices for your own company that you can codify using policy as code. And then there is other stuff, uh, but I do want to focus on image verification, resource optimization, and, and some of this multi-tenancy stuff for, for which you can use policies as well. So one way I've seen a lot of our customers do um, automated namespace provisioning, they actually do have a format for namespace naming, and then they make sure that everyone in the organization follows the same set of naming of the namespace. And then they know who the owner is, how to reach out to them in case any production issue happens. Now, you should also think about applying poli policies to your holistic environment, not just for Kubernetes, not just for applications that are running on Kubernetes. You may have to look at other sort of solutions. Uh, but if you're using policy, if you're using those guardrails, ultimately, it helps you move fast and move fast with some level of confidence. 
The way you can think about policy enforcement in um, Kubernetes, you know, you start with a code because policy is nothing but a piece of code. And, um, you know, whenever you're going through your CI pipeline, your continuous integration, you can include those policies during the build and test sort of uh, step. And then you get, you immediately know that uh, you are not compliant with the set of policies which your platform and security team is suggesting. You do the next check at the deploy time, so at the admission time, when you're saying kubectl apply, the same checks happen again. And then at runtime also, there is continuous sort of audit that happens. So all of these steps are basically giving you defense in depth and, and some more sort of um, layered security to make sure that unchecked code or code that is not compliant doesn't make it into your environment. Now coming back to the topic, which is how can you shift down on misconfigurations? So like Jim was saying, we want to make sure that security team works with the platform team. And if you're thinking about you know, starting or adopting policies with PSS baseline, or let's say all or some of the Kubernetes CIS benchmark, then what you can do is you can write those policies once, keep them in a GitHub repo, and it sort of follows this life cycle, right? You develop those policies jointly with your security platform, maybe application teams also, and then the policy goes through the similar life cycle once you have tested them, validated them, you can then distribute your policies at scale to all of your Kubernetes clusters. Um, you can simply just do kubectl apply, but you know, that doesn't scale very well if you have hundreds of clusters. So you have to figure out something, something similar to Argo CD or other tooling that you can use to distribute policies at scale. And then you can audit or enforce um, you know, logs get generated, events get generated. You can observe those, create some reporting, and then you keep doing this cycle as new sort of rules um, come into picture. And this is how you can shift down on security. You do not want to shift down on misconfigurations. So you, you are not asking every single team to write their own sort of uh, policies, what you're doing is you're centralizing your sort of most important policies. And then your teams have flexibility as well. They can write their own policies if they're, they are a large group of uh, engineers. And if your applications and services are built in a consistent way, they can actually do that. But this will reduce a lot of toil in your uh, organization. Now let's talk about how can we shift down on the secure software supply chain. So, uh, you know, for securing your uh, supply chain and making sure the um, artifacts which are running in your clusters are assigned at proper step, uh, stages and then, you know, you do the attestation, you do the verification and you make sure that whatever is running on your clusters has gone through the checks and balances that your organization is interested in, um, in ensuring. One of the ways you can think about it is, you know, Salsa is a good model to think about a secure software supply chain and, and at what level you are. They have like four levels. Level zero is, I think everybody's at level zero, and then you can make your way up. Um, but what it gives you is a checklist or a list of rules. And then, similar to misconfiguration, what you can do is you collaborate with other groups within your organization. You codify those rules. Um, you do come up with a um, set of checkpoints that we are going to sign our software after it has passed this particular checkpoint. And then you do the verification um, for your images at the admission time and at runtime, similar to misconfigurations. But you can also centralize this uh, function, which basically improves your overall security posture. 
Jim? Thank you. So we believe we're at a interesting inflection point in security, right? So Kubernetes, cloud native technologies like containers, other you know, cloud native tooling has given us a layer of standardization we never had before. Right now with platform engineering, we're pushing towards self-service, more agility, the ability for app teams to move faster, even faster, and to be able to consume complex infrastructure as well as patterns in an easy manner, right? The evolution of this, we need to, you know, if you kind of think about the last five to 10 years with the, the journey with Kubernetes containers, we've done a lot of, you know, automation on the operation side. The same needs to happen to security and platform engineering, platform teams, we believe are the key to making this happen. So today, you know, we talked about a few things, you know, which is currently what you can almost immediately start doing. And platform teams, the main message here, if anything, is they need to think of not just delivering agility, but also delivering proper security and offloading security teams for some of these key functions. So for vulnerability management, we talked about base images, why they matter, adopting or researching things like WEX and open WEX. Uh, for misconfiguration, certainly doubling down on policy as code, with reporting, exception management, the whole life cycle and making sure that that's customizable no matter which policy engine or tool you use. And then finally on the software supply chain, starting to make advances and move you know, up those levels of salsa like Poonam described. Yeah, and we do run the policy work group, both Jim and I and uh, Andy who's not here, we are co-chairs. So we meet bi-weekly and we have some interesting sort of projects that we've been working on in the policy space. If you're interested, uh, you can just uh, join us and you know, give us feedback. We are, we are happy to have anyone. Um, there's no minimum sort of knowledge needed. If you just want to learn, you can just uh, join us. And then we also have another blog which is published by Richard Siroder on the same topic. If you want to read more about it, you can do that. And again, we want to say it again that shift down and uh, shift left, they are not mutually exclusive, right? You can shift down and do shift left. It is just a matter of finding sort of the right balance which works for your organization. And uh, if you're using Gatekeeper, Kaiverno, uh, open source tools for Kubernetes policy, do let us know the feedback. We would love to hear from you. Yeah, and as you see, Richard's a little bit more opinionated about this topic than us, but um, you know, we feel that balance is important. So thank you, and you know, happy to answer any questions. I think we have a couple of minutes, and certainly, like Poonam said, we want to continue this conversation. This is more the beginnings of what we feel a very interesting trend in our space, so excited to hear from everybody. Any questions, yeah. thoughts, things there's, we can help question, with? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. So the distribution for VEX that's being discussed is through OCI images. In fact, there was a talk at this very same time where a few folks in the community were presenting that. Um, so one way to centralize or distribute is to sign, much like with any other attestation, create a VEX document, sign it, attach it to your OCI images, which can be consumed again through policy engines like Kiverno or Gatekeeper and then verified at runtime.
But I mean, you want to share your thoughts first? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so let me take a stab on it. Feel free to jump in. Um, I think the key, the core of this is, you know, policy is nothing but a piece of code or a YAML file in the land of Kubernetes. So uh, a lot of collaboration in the enterprises, it used to happen over, you know, there's a long checklist or a big document that somebody has written. And now we have to make sure that we are meeting all of these controls. So there's a lot of back and forth, and then there is not a quantitative sort of continuous evidence that you can gather that you are actually uh, compliant with those rules. So the way we've shifted, or at least we are trying to shift as an industry, is now you can collaborate as a, you know, at a Git repo level. And whatever checklist or rules that you have for your organization, you codify them. And you do it once. You know, you go through maybe Rego or you pick, you know, Kaverno or any other tooling that is available, but you have to pick something and you have to start somewhere. Uh, but once you've done the work of codifying things, then it is just a matter of rinse and repeat. You know, you, you just go through that process again and you add one more rule or, you know, there is a new compliance standard that is coming in or uh, Kubernetes CS benchmark added something and you just have to incrementally just build on top of that. So it's more like practicing how to, uh, you know, automate the process and it's just a mental model change in my opinion. But I think that's the core of it. Once you have that, then you will see that you'll be able to do things in a faster way. And, uh, uh, you will have reporting, you will have uh, uh, sort of more actionable insights into why you're meeting or not meeting a certain standard. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, just a couple more things to add to that, right? So speaking of reporting, in the policy working group, we are publishing a common reporting format, which can be used not just by you know, policy engines, but any other scanner or any other tool. So getting to that unified reporting is important. And I believe the easier you make policies, the better, right? So just like with containers and the evolution uh, we have seen there, and Pushkar and I were also talking about this earlier. Uh, you know, it's interesting, like Rego started as a language outside of Kubernetes. It was implemented in Kubernetes by things like Gatekeeper. Kiverno came along and sort of made that more declarative, easier. Now we have things like validating admission policy, mutating admission policy, which goes to the next level. And both projects, you know, Gatekeeper as well as Kiverno, are implementing those as native policy constructs they support with Cell, right? So standardizing, definitely, if you haven't looked at Cell, I would say highly recommend put that on your lengthy list of things to learn, right? Because uh, that's you know being used in many places in Kubernetes, and Kiverno policies as well as Gatekeeper is also kind of moving to adopting Cell, and there's pros and cons for every tool and every you know uh, thing there. Yeah. yeah, I see. Whenever you're saying Gatekeeper, you're looking at me. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, we're All right. right. All right. So, yes, yeah. but uh, I do recommend looking at WAP. WAP is pretty cool because you don't have to install anything. It's built into the API server. Uh, but again, it doesn't give you the flexibility. So there are always trade-offs to the tooling that you're picking. Uh, but if it is something that works for you, then that's enough, I guess. Still, it should be handed over to the, the security team. Like, what, what is your, uh, your 
So I, I can start with a political answer. <laughs> it, it's yeah. Security is everybody's responsibility, like in an organization. And that is sounds cheesy, but it is true. Um, and I think going back to, and it's my opinion, take it with a, a grain of salt, I do think that there is some sort of you know, you have different types of user personas. So wearing my PM hat, um, there are platform admins who care about Kubernetes. You know, who day in day out they are just working on Kubernetes. But for an organization, you have more than that that you need to worry about. So if you have a centralized security team or CISO team, they care about Kubernetes, but they also care about things which are broader than that, right? So there is a need to sort of have two sort of views, one which is related to your platform, runtime security, and the platform team gets visibility to this, but then also this feeds into sort of your central organizational uh, seam or whatever tooling that you use. So you have a view of everything that is going on, and you can make sure that you're securing the entire ecosystem. Jim, you want to add? Yeah, totally agree with that. I think, um, you know, and as we've had conversations with security teams, and, you know, as much as we love Kubernetes and Cloud Native, it's not the top of their priority list always, right? And that has led to some of these headlines and things that Poonam shared. So somebody needs to set up and do this. And it's not the same tools. Like, even if you think about how tools are designed, most security teams want something which is you know, perhaps like more UI driven, more con consolidated, gets to the core problems, detects things. So runtime tools are built for a different purpose versus us as maybe platform engineers or Kubernetes you know, oriented folks. We want declarative configs, we want to use GitOps, very different mindsets, right? So I, I feel there's a need for that central security to continue to manage runtime at that higher level. For Kubernetes runtime, it's somewhere in between, depends on the organization. Yeah. But certainly the rest of the things like we talked about here, but you know, as you look at what can you automate and shift down, there's some very low hanging fruit that can be done right away. And if you are an organization who is all in on Kubernetes and runs all yeah. these, your software stack on Kubernetes, then it becomes simpler to, to answer that question. I think we might be out of time. Um, so thank you again for coming. Enjoy the rest of the conference. And oh, hopefully you know, this was useful. I would love to hear your feedback. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much.